Good morning, Grant County. I'm Pastor Terry Leap from the Williamstown Baptist Church, welcoming you once again to our weekly live broadcast of our Sunday morning worship services, saying on behalf of our whole church family, how blessed we are, how overjoyed we are that you join us each week, that you take the time to participate in worship with us from home, that you pray for us, that you support us with your prayers. On behalf of our whole church family, I just want to say thank you. As we do every Sunday morning, we have some special things in store for you today, and we pray that your heart is prepared to be blessed. We have some wonderful singing this morning, a special song that I know will be a blessing to your heart, and a song that's going to really prepare you for the message this morning from John chapter 1. Now we're starting a series of preaching through the Gospel of John, and today we're going to take the time just to look at some really deep and important theological truths found in John chapter 1 verses 1 and 2. So turn there with us this morning. Prepare to follow along not only with our singing, but also with the teaching of God's Word. And we pray that through everything that's done here today, Jesus Christ is lifted up and that you might be drawn closer to Him. Be sure to reach out to us anytime this week. You can call our church office. I know the number will be displayed throughout the broadcast. Share with us your prayer requests, concerns. Share with us some blessings, good things that are going on in your life. Let us know how we can pray for you. As always, remember to visit our website at www.williamstownbaptistchurch.com. We pray that you're prepared this morning to be blessed. Good morning, church. It got awful quiet there as I walked in. There's no need to stop fellowshipping and talking on my account. I'm glad to look out and see you all gathered here this morning especially you who are guests with us. Thank you for choosing to worship with us today. Uh, do us this one favor. If you're a guest, on behalf of our whole church, just let me say thank you for choosing to be with us. Uh, but fill out this little portion of your bulletin that can be torn out. We call it our connection card. Fill that out for us. Place it in the offering plate in just a little bit so that we will know that you were with us this morning and we can pray for you and find out how God is at work in your life. Now, let me draw your attention just to a couple of announcements inside the bulletin. <clears throat> if you'll look in there with me, you'll see that we have a concert coming up on Friday the 15th that I am hoping a number of you will plan to attend. Um, if a number of us can get there together, maybe we'll go out afterwards and eat, fellowship. But uh, it's a free concert, free concert being offered at the Grace and Peace Presbyterian Church in Florence. This is right at the split of 25 and 42 where the Florence Post Office is at. Grace and Peace Presbyterian Church will be hosting uh, Matt Smith and Indelible Grace. This is fantastic worship music that I think will be a blessing to you. If you have any questions or would like to attend, let me know and I'll do my best to answer them. Now, for all of our men, listen up, men, just for one moment. Wake up and stay with me for just a second, okay? Next Saturday, men, we're having a wild game dinner here at the church. We're hosting it. It's actually the Crittenden Baptist Association that's putting it on, but we're hosting this, and we really want you to come out and help us to make this a success. We're going to be smoking some meat and getting some food prepared. Uh, we've got a gospel bluegrass group that's coming, Timberline Road, and uh, Brother Gary Parker, pastor at Livingston Baptist Church. That's the little uh, corner of the world from which my wife comes, and uh, Pastor Gary's going to be up here speaking and sharing his testimony if you will bring some friends with you, some men that may not come to church regularly, uh, they're going to experience food, fellowship, and they're going to hear the gospel as well. So please, let's make a, a good attempt at coming out and attending. We have 29 churches in the Crittenden Association. If each church just brought 10 people, we'd have almost 300 men here. I think we can do better than 10, so let's bring out a good crowd next Saturday evening. Seniors, you'll see the announcement there about the Senior Living Celebration and also the next Super Seniors meeting on April the 11th. Please remember these things. And then tonight, in our evening service, we have our regular monthly business meeting. Now, I'm going to encourage you every month to come to the business meeting because it's important. It matters. Uh, the finances that are discussed are your finances. The motions that are made are concerning the direction of your church. But tonight, we have one particular issue that's coming up that some of you may have some good feedback on. Uh, it's an important issue. I'm not being fired that I know of. Okay, so it's not that. I didn't hear enough laughter there. It makes me a little nervous. 
It, it's an altogether different issue, though, and we want you to come back tonight and make sure you're a part of that meeting with us. Pretty important decision, and we want you to have your opportunity to give us feedback, okay? So let's stand together this morning for the reading of God's Word. I'm going to ask you to turn to John chapter 1. This will also be our text a little bit later. But John chapter 1, I want to begin reading in verse 1, John's prologue, and read down through verse 18. Let's hear the word of God together this morning. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light, that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came rather to bear witness about the light. The true light, which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me, because he was before me. And from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God, who is at the Father's side, he has made him known. Would you bow with me this morning as we pray? Father, I ask, Lord, that by your Spirit this morning, our hearts would be opened, our minds and our ears would be opened, that we would hear and understand and receive and be transformed by the truth of your word. Father, these are deep and difficult things that we will look at this morning, and we are living in dark and difficult days. We live in a time in which it's not popular to hold to the truths of God's word or to stand firm on beliefs that may separate us from others, but I pray that you would give us a depth of conviction this morning concerning your word, concerning your son, concerning your gospel. And that all who are gathered here today will hear the gospel of Christ and the love of Christ proclaimed and be drawn to him by your spirit, Lord. That we would worship in song and in giving and in fellowship in such a way that lives are transformed right here. We thank you for this church and all that it means to us. We thank you for our Savior. May we lift up his name today and give him glory, we pray, together as one body. Amen. Turn with a smile on your face and greet someone next to you. Make them feel welcome this morning.
Gene, would you pray for us?
done or more appropriate song to lead us into our text in John chapter 1 this morning. What makes for good worship music is not smoke and lights and mirrors and how many instruments you can get on a stage. It's the voices of God's people and the truths that are being sung. And in that song, you just heard tremendous theological depth in that song. I hope you were reading the lyrics there on the screen behind me as Marcy sang it. And it's so appropriate in the light of what we're going to look at here this morning in just a few moments from John chapter 1. I do want to pause, though, and call our church just to a quick moment of prayer. Uh, We want to remember to pray this morning for the Workman family, uh, for Mitch and Pam especially. We just got word a little bit ago. It's okay to say this, Josh, that uh, Mrs. Workman, who we've had on our prayer list for a long time, Mitch's mom, Uh, passed this morning. And so we want to be in prayer for the whole family and pause for a moment just to lift them up. So before we get into God's word, would you bow with me? Father, we pray right now for your comforting presence to be with and among all of those close and extended members of the Workman family who are grieving right now over the loss of Mrs. Workman this morning. Uh, We thank you for a life that was well lived, for a life that has left a strong legacy of family and faith. Many in this church, I know, are thankful for the relationship, the friendship, the knowledge that they had of her and certainly of her family. We pray for Mitch and Pam this morning and again other family members that I may not know uh, of personally, but I know they have given so much care to their mother in these last few months, even these last few years. We pray that you would bless them, ease their comfort, and Father, fill their hearts with the hope that comes through knowing Christ. For we do not grieve as others grieve who have no hope. We grieve, yes, but it is in the light of the hope that one day Jesus will come again and call us forth from our graves, from the ground, some unto life eternal and some unto condemnation. But Lord, those who know life eternal have hope. So we pray for them now in Jesus' name. Amen. In John chapter 1 this morning, I want you to look just at the first two verses with me. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. It's actually kind of a strange way, isn't it, to begin the telling of the story of Jesus, the gospel that John writes. Uh, John is unique in the way that he tells his story. In fact, you might think about it like this. If if there were a a car crash out front, we heard uh, brakes screech and tires screech and, 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 and glass break, and everybody ran to the back window and stood and watched for a few moments as everything transpired and everyone was okay and the ambulance arrived and so on and so forth. If I asked you a day later to tell me what happened at the car crash yesterday, and if I asked every one of you to do that, we would probably have 200 different stories, wouldn't we? 
And some of you might place an emphasis on some detail that somebody else didn't. And some of you might remember some minor point that other people didn't bring up. Some of you might focus on the fact that it happened during church, and some people might not mention that at all. And some might focus on the sounds and how they alerted us to the the accident, and some people might not even mention the sounds. They might focus more on the people. I think you get the point that I'm making here in the telling of stories. The gospel stories, the gospel accounts in our Bibles, the inspired accounts of Jesus' life, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, to some extent, they are that way also. They tell the story of Jesus Christ in different ways. They tell us different aspects, different angles, different details. They're, they're, They're not all alike, but they are kind of similar. In fact, Uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, we refer to as the synoptic gospels. You might want to write that down, synoptic. It's S-Y-N, optic. And and as you might guess from those two words, originally in the Greek, those two words mean to, to see together. So Matthew, Mark, and Luke kind of see the life of Jesus in a similar fashion, don't they? Matthew, Mark, and Luke, uh, they, 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 they function on sort of a linear timeline from the beginning of Jesus' ministry unto his death and his burial and his resurrection. And they tell about his parables and his teachings. And, and Matthew and Luke even start at his birth. And they tell us a little something about his childhood and his family history and all. Uh, they, generally speaking, see the life of Jesus in a similar way. But John is not that way at all. In fact, John is not a synoptic gospel. John is very different in his approach to telling the story of Jesus. He gives us lots of details that aren't found in the other books, and there's lots of things that they talk about that John doesn't cover. In his commentary on John's gospel, writer and pastor John MacArthur says this, even a cursory reading of John's gospel reveals it to be strikingly different from the other three. All four Gospels contain a mixture of narrative history and discourses of Jesus. John's Gospel, however, contains a higher proportion of discourse in relation to narrative than do the synoptics. In other words, John has a lot more teaching and dialogue back and forth between individuals. Whereas the synoptic Gospels have a lot more of Jesus' public teaching. It flows in more of a narrative way. He goes on to say of John's Gospel, You won't find any eschatological discourses, no accounts of Jesus exercising demons or healing lepers, no list of the twelve apostles, no formal institution of the Lord's Supper. You won't find those in John's Gospel. John also does not record Jesus' birth, his baptism, his transfiguration, his temptation, his agony in Gethsemane, or his ascension. Now, you might be saying at this point, why are we preaching through this gospel? <laughs> you know, I had a lot of positive response last week. People were saying, hey, we're excited about this. Going through the gospel of John, this is going to be great. Now you're thinking, wait a minute, John's a lot different. Let me finish, though. On the other hand, John includes a large amount of material. In fact, more than 90% of the gospel of John is not found in the synoptics such as the prologue that we read earlier, verses 1 through 18. You won't find that in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. You don't find the pre-incarnate existence of Jesus covered in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. You don't find Jesus' early ministry in Judea and Samaria, His first miracle, turning the water into wine, His dialogue with Nicodemus, His encounter with a Samaritan woman, His healing of a lame man in chapter 5, a blind man in chapter 9, The bread of life discourse in chapter 6, the living water claim in chapter 7, you won't find him taking for himself the name of God. You don't find that in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. But you find it definitively in John's gospel. You don't see Jesus presenting himself as the good shepherd in other places, only in John. The resurrection of Lazarus, the washing of the disciples' feet, the upper room discourse, the high priestly prayer of chapter 17, the miraculous catch of fish in chapter 21, and the recommissioning of Peter in chapter 21. You're also going to see a lot more teaching and emphasis on the Holy Spirit in John than you do the synoptics. 
Two things, he concludes, must be borne in mind concerning the differences between John and the Synoptic Gospels. First of all, the differences are not contradictions. Nothing in John's Gospel contradicts the Synoptic Gospels and vice versa. Secondly, the differences between John and the Synoptics must not be exaggerated. All four Gospels present Jesus Christ as the Son of Man, Israel's Messiah, the Son of God, God in human flesh. All four Gospels picture him as the Savior who came to save his people from their sins, who died a sacrificial death on the cross, rose from the dead, and ascended back to heaven. There's no question that the Gospels do not contradict one another, but instead they actually interlock together like the pieces of a puzzle. They're woven together in the way that they tell their story of who Jesus is. And in fact, the prologue that we're going to begin looking at now in verses 1 through 18 is a part of John's unique way of telling the story of Jesus that Matthew, Mark, and Luke do not cover. For John is going to step outside of any human timeline or any human chronology and talk about who was Jesus before the incarnation. Now think about that with me for a moment. Because many of you have never stopped to think about Jesus before his birth in the manger. And this is why I said earlier and had a little picture up there about we're going to wade into some deep theological waters. Some people never stop to think about the existence of Jesus Christ prior to his birth in the manger. We love the baby Jesus in the manger. We love Christmas. We love celebrating the birth of Christ, the incarnation, his coming into the world, or as John says in verse 14 of this chapter, the incarnation, the birth of Jesus, was when the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And John says, we were able to see his glory. Glory is of the only Son, the only begotten, your translation may say, from the Father, full of grace and truth. But Jesus' existence didn't start there. Now, we, we have to be very specific in saying that we as human beings do not exist prior to our conception or birth. Think about this. We do not exist prior to our conception or birth. There are many false teachings. There are false world religions out there that will say that uh, we as human beings, our, our souls are eternal, that before we were born, we existed in the presence of God, we were spirits in His presence, and then when the time was right, we were born into this world. There's no evidence at all in the Bible of that. That's more false religion than it is biblical. But Jesus Christ, and this is one of the things that makes Him unique, this is one of the things that qualifies him to be the Messiah. This points to his divinity, in fact. He did exist prior to the incarnation. Although God has a knowledge of us in time, it cannot be said that we exist prior to our conception in the womb or that we have any substance before our birth. But John starts off his gospel by telling us Jesus was not like us in this regard. Think about this. Last week we looked at chapter 20, verses 30 and 31. The way John starts his gospel fits perfectly with his purpose, doesn't it? His purpose in writing this gospel is to convince you that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and that through believing in Him, you may have life. This is an apologetic argument. And by the way, to clarify, apologetics does not mean we're apologizing for something. That's not what it means in the Christian context. Christian apologetics means an argument. This is John's argument for the truth concerning who Jesus is. And the fact that he begins with the pre-incarnate existence of Christ fits perfectly because he wants you to know that Jesus was no ordinary man. This 
prologue of his, verses 1 through 18, which is unique to his gospel, climaxes, if you will, in verse 14 with the event of the incarnation, the word becoming flesh and dwelling among us, literally pitching his tent, verse 14 that's the Greek word. The word became flesh, dwelt among us, skeneo, to, to pitch a tent or a tabernacle. Jesus Christ dwelt among us for a season when he took on flesh. But that wasn't his beginning. He existed before the incarnation event, before his conception by the Holy Spirit in Mary's womb. And in the, incarna in the incarnation, what we in fact have is the eternal one becoming man stepping into time now john lays out an argument in verses 1 through 5 and he points to three things that make jesus unique he points to three evidences and we're only going to look at the first one this morning in verses 1 and 2 which is john pointing specifically to the pre-existence of christ the pre-existence of christ and here's how we're going to go about this. You're going to see in verse 1, three statements. Three definitive theological statements that John makes in verse 1, which he is then just going to basically restate or reiterate in verse 2. So we're not going to have to spend much time on verse 2. Verse 2 is really, in many ways, just a restatement of what he's going to say in verse 1. But in verse 1, he gives us three statements about the nature of Jesus that make him unique as our Messiah, the Son of God. The first one is a statement of Jesus' eternality. Look with me at verse 1. In the beginning was the Word. In the beginning was the Word. This kind of sounds like, uh, for those of you familiar with it, it sounds like Master Yoda talk, doesn't it? We've kind of got things backwards to the way that we would normally say them. But, but here's what John is telling us. Three really key important words in this passage. Beginning, was, and word. Beginning, was, and word. The word beginning here from the Greek is, is the word RK, and it literally points to the beginning of time as we know it. The beginning of time as we know it, specifically in the creation event. Do you think it's an accident that John's first few words sound just like Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1? It's no accident. He uses the same language of creation when Yahweh in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1 created in the beginning. Only now we're talking about Jesus. RK, the word there for beginning, refers to the beginning of the universe as depicted in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1. And here's what John is saying. When the beginning happened, when the beginning happened, the word already was. Think about that with me. Take a moment, let it settle in. When the beginning happened, the word, and I'm adding the word already, the word already was. The Greek verb here for was has the idea of continual action. The word was already continually in existence before the beginning of time. Now, you and I have a very limited concept of time. For us, time begins with the creation of the physical universe. Right? Think back as far as you can. All we can conceive of exists within the context of this universe. All of the Milky Ways, all of the stars, all of the farthest reaches of the universe where the, the Hubble uh, uh, spacecraft is going and sending back pictures and all of the black holes and all of that. Listen, there was a time when all of that was not, when it did not exist. The universe itself is not eternal. It was created at a point in time by a God who already existed. Wrap your mind around this. If God already existed when the universe was created, then he is outside of and apart from time. He is indeed eternal. I, I know, I know it's tough. You're going, come on, preacher, I didn't come to church to hear this this morning. Tell me Jesus loves me. Well, well he does, but listen, I want you to get this, okay? There is a beginning of time for us. There is a beginning of the universe. And no, I don't believe this is the Big Bang, if some of you are thinking that in your head. No, the Big Bang doesn't solve the issue of origins for the non-Christian. 
It only pushes it back a little bit. Because for there to be a Big Bang, there still had to be stuff, right? There was a time when there was no stuff at all. There was just God. Father, Son, and Spirit. Eternally, God. And there was no universe, and there was no Milky Way, and there was no Big Bangs or black holes or time as we know it. There was just God. Before the beginning of time as we know it. And in that period, before the beginning of time, John tells us the Word already existed. He already was. Jesus Christ was already in existence when the heavens and earth were created. Thus, He is not a created being. But He existed from all eternity. Marcus Dodds says this in the Expositor's Bible Commentary. The Logos, the Word, did not then begin to be, but at that point at which all else began to be, He already was. In the beginning, place it where you may, the Word already existed. In other words, the Logos, he says, is before time eternal. The verb that's used there stresses that the Word had always existed. There was never a point when He came into being. He simply was. And then we come to this third key important word that I want you to think about. Not only beginning and was, but why does John choose to refer to the one we know as Jesus as the Word? It's obvious that the Word is Jesus when you read on in this passage. Verse 14, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, the only Son of the Father. Okay, it's clear that in John's mind, as he's writing this inspired by the Spirit, he's equating the Word to Jesus. Make sure you get that, all right? So we're talking about Jesus here, and we're saying before the beginning, He was. So why doesn't He just come out and say in the beginning was Jesus? Wouldn't that have been easier? There's a lot of speculation as to exactly why the Spirit inspired John to write this. I think it's very simple. John was writing to a larger audience than just Romans, than just Greeks, than just Jews. He was writing to a universal audience. His gospel is a universal gospel. And with the Greek word logos, which we translate word, and this gets kind of tricky sometimes because you say with the word, word, you know. Uh, with the logos, though... Logos is a Greek concept that the philosophers strove to understand. To the Greeks, the word logos is heavy with meaning. The logos was the impersonal, abstract principle of reason and order in the universe. The Greeks who did not know God, who did not know Yahweh, who had not received an understanding of who he was, they sought to know what was that, that overriding concept. You find this, by the way, if you read any of the classics, Plato, Aristotle, you'll, you'll find them referring to reason, uh, the, this impersonal force that holds the universe together, that, that brought it all into being. This sort of reminds us of the Apostle Paul in Acts chapter 17 when he goes preaching to the philosophers and he says, the, the unknown God that you haven't figured out, let me tell you who he is. It's not an it, it's a he, he's a person. Well, the Greeks, those with a philosophical background, all that they understood to be the, the overriding, impersonal, abstract force or principle of reason and order in the universe, they called the Logos. Hebrews, that is Jews, they also had a pretty deep understanding and connection with this idea of word. In fact, when you read through the Old Testament, starting in Genesis chapter 1, when Yahweh chooses to create, how does he do it? Does he wave a magic wand? No, he speaks, right? And his word comes forth from his mouth and creates. All throughout the Old Testament, this concept of Yahweh's Word, God's Word, as being the full expression of divine power and wisdom, you find it all over the Old Testament. So that when God made a covenant with Abram, 
He made it by His Word. When He spoke His commandments to His people through Moses, He did it by His Word. When He uh, revealed Himself to them in the glory of Solomon's temple, He comes and He speaks to them by His Word. And His presence is always made known by His Word. And over and over again, when the prophets speak, what do they say? This is the Word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord. Yahweh, the Eternal One, the Creator, He speaks. He reveals Himself to us. And so John, under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, takes this word that had deep significance to the philosophers, as well as deep significance to the Jewish mindset, and he puts them together and says, The word of the Lord, the overriding concept that holds the universe together, he tells us in these verses, that is God as revealed through Jesus Christ. In the beginning was the word. The eternality of Jesus, John makes very clear to us. The word is going to be the incarnation of divine power and divine revelation. This word that's going to come to God's people is going to be his final word to mankind. And so the author of Hebrews would say in Hebrews chapter 1 verses 1 and 2, God, after he spoke long ago to our fathers in the prophets in many portions and in many ways, in these last days he has spoken to us in his Son. The Word is going to become flesh and communicate to mankind. Verse 14, what the Father is like. He's full of grace and truth. He brings us grace upon grace, verse 16. The law came through Moses, but notice what's going to come through the incarnate Word, grace. And truth is going to come through Jesus Christ. And look how John ends his prologue in verse 18. Nobody's ever seen God. It's through His Word. His Word incarnate, Jesus Christ, that God is made known. Let me move to the second statement that he makes in verse 1. Not only is Jesus' eternality at play here, but look at the second statement. The Word was with God. In the second definitive statement that John makes in verse 1, he's pointing to the communion or fellowship between the eternal Word and the Father. Now again, put your, put your critical thinking cap on here. We're not saying that Father, Son, and Spirit existed eternally, separated from one another without a knowledge of each other. That would be multiple gods. That's not what we believe at all. In the Trinity, we believe that Father, Son, and Spirit, though they are co-equal in substance and in nature, they are defined differently by their roles or their economy, but Father, Son, and Spirit existed together and in fellowship with one another. In fact, later on, Jesus is going to pray in John chapter 17 in his high priestly prayer. He's speaking to the Father and he says, and I'm paraphrasing here, Father, I long for that fellowship that you and I had before the world began. Jesus is referring back to the time when he was in perfect fellowship with the Father. Look at these words. The word was with God. Prostantheon in the Greek. A phrase that literally means face-to-face. It's face-to-face engagement. The Word and the Father coexisted in fellowship and in harmony. They knew one another. They spoke with one another. They engaged one another. And it is upon these grounds, mind you, that the Apostle Paul is going to say in Philippians chapter 2 to the church, be humble. Because think about how humble Jesus was when he laid aside, when he laid aside the eternal glory of being in the presence of the Father and came down here and dwelt with us. Philippians 2. 
Paul says our humility is grounded in the fact that we understand that Jesus Christ was once in the presence of the Father, that he enjoyed fellowship and communion and oneness with God, that he saw the eternal Father face to face and he was willing to lay that aside to come down here and die on a cross for you. That should, that should humble us and cause us to be humble one towards another. Jesus, as the second person of the Trinity, from all eternity, was with the Father in deep, intimate fellowship. We gather from this that the eternal word has personality. This is not an it. This is a he. That, that he has enjoyed communion with the Father. That he left behind the glory of the presence of God to carry out the Father's scheme of redemption. It tells us that our triune God exists eternally in communion and in fellowship. And when we are created in the image of God, as Genesis chapter 1 tells us, one of those aspects of God's image is that He created us to be in fellowship one with another. Uh, listen, here's a very practical implication of this. Uh, God did not create you to exist on your own. He didn't create you to walk through this world alone or to be a Lone Ranger Christian. This is one reason, one significant reason, why body life in the church matters. Church matters. Membership matters. Being a part of this community of faith matters because it's a reflection of what we believe about God Himself. He exists eternally. Father, Son, Spirit in communion with one another. And Jesus... Furthermore, has strong grounds on which to claim, and he will later in this gospel, that he knows the Father, right? Now later we're going to see him arguing with scribes and Pharisees and critics and skeptics, and they're going to say, wait a minute, who are you to tell us about God? And Jesus is going to respond by saying, I have been with the Father. I know the Father. You only know the Father in part. You've only received bits and pieces of what he's like, but Jesus is going to say, I have been in the presence of the Father. And so his pre-existence gives him authority to speak to humanity about what the Father is like. John points to Jesus' eternality. He points to his face-to-face -face communion and fellowship with the Father. Notice this third statement, which I think is the crescendo of John's opening clause, simply stated, the third definitive statement is, the Word was God. The Word was God. Not less than God. Not a created being. Not a God not one who will be exalted to become a god. John doesn't say any of those things, all of which, by the way, are heresies, but which many people, sometimes even within the church, embrace. John doesn't say that. He could have said that, by the way. He had the language and the skills. He had the grammar to do it. But he says at the end of verse 1, this word who is eternal, who has existed face to face with the Father, this word was God. No clearer statement of Jesus' divinity exists in all of the New Testament than John's pronouncement in chapter 1 and verse 1 of his gospel. He didn't waste any time getting deep and divisive, did he? He leaves no room here for you to conclude that Jesus was, eh, he's a good guy. I like Jesus, he's all right. He gives me a good positive vibe. He teaches me how to love, teaches me how to help little old widows. He teaches me it's nice to give every now and then, but I'm not in for all that theology stuff. Then you're not reading your Bible. John wastes no time saying, the Word is eternal. He existed in the presence of God, and that's because He is God. He restates the definitive truth in verse 2, reiterating everything that he's already said in verse 1. This word, this word that has been manifest in our presence, this Jesus, is unique on a number of grounds. He's not like us. He existed before his incarnation. He's eternal. 
He knows God. He's been in His presence. Not only does He know God, but He is God. Now, let me conclude this morning with a couple of, of applications of these truths because you will tend to hear things like this and I know right now, I know that in many people's minds you're hearing this stuff and going, come on, wrap this up. I'm not interested in all the deep theology. That's why we pay you, preacher. We don't go to seminary and we, we're not interested in all that and we're never going to use this stuff in the world. Wrong. Yar. These things are important and they matter. Look at these applications. Number one, you cannot read this text and come to any other conclusion but this conclusion. Jesus Christ is God. He is divine. He's the second person of the triune God. And Orthodox Christianity has embraced and proclaimed this doctrine for 2,000 years. This is nothing new. We are called upon to believe here. We must believe that Jesus Christ is God. It is a truth revealed in the scriptures, proclaimed by Jesus himself, preached by his apostles, expounded upon throughout the ages, defended and upheld by the early church in multiple councils. And I would add, it is a truth perpetually attacked by the heretics. In fact, if you've ever shared Jesus with someone, who's an unbeliever, who doesn't believe that Jesus is God and the Son of God and all of this, sometimes you'll hear statements like this. I like the Jesus that, that, that loves me and the Jesus that uh, you know, teaches me to walk little old ladies across the street and teaches me to be nice. I like that Jesus, but I'm not so sure about all the God stuff. Lots of people go through their Christian lives with that concept of Jesus. And here's what they'll say. Jesus never said that about himself. There is no more statement that is ignorant of the scriptures than that statement. You, you've not read the Gospel of John if you say Jesus never claimed for himself deity. I, I can show you just a couple of places. You can look at them with me real quickly. Look in John chapter 8 and verse 58. Uh, truly, truly, Jesus says, after a long discourse about coming before Abraham, Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. He's directly linking himself with the divine I am of Exodus chapter 3. And what does verse 59 say? Uh, the Jews just shrugged their shoulders at this. No. They took up stones to kill him for blasphemy. You don't kill a guy just because you disagree with him. Okay? You take up stones to kill someone because they have committed a blasphemous act. You say, well, I'm still not convinced. Okay, turn the page to chapter 10 of John's Gospel. Chapter 10, and look at verse 30. In verse 30, Jesus says, I and the Father are one. That's like one of my sons saying about their relationship with me, that we are one, that we are of the same substance, of the same stuff. And look at verse 31. The Jews picked up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, I've shown you many good works from the Father. For which of them are you going to stone me? Verse 33, the Jews answered him, It's not for good works that we're going to stone you, but for blasphemy, because you, being a man, make yourself God. Well, Jesus never said that stuff about himself. You've not read your Bible. Jesus did claim this about himself. He leaves no room for dispute or debate. And even though this truth is constantly and perpetually attacked, Gnosticism, Arianism, Docetism, Modalism, Ebionism, Marcionism, we could go on and on talking about all of the various different doctrinal heresies that reject the divinity of Jesus Christ. Even though it's perpetually attacked, the Word of God states it to be true. The truth of Jesus' deity and full equality with the Father is a non-negotiable element of the Christian faith, fully established in Scripture, worthy of our defense, and a truth that must not be compromised in our world today. The second truth, or application, flows out of the first. When rightly understood, Jesus' divine nature sets Orthodox Christianity apart from every other belief system in the world. It makes Christianity unique. 
This is why we must not compromise and budge on this truth. Not only is it revealed in Scripture, not only does Jesus say it for himself, but this is what makes Christianity unique. And this is one of the things that makes Jesus exclusively the only Savior by which men can come to know God. It was him, remember, who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Well, I don't know about that Jesus. Jesus never says that stuff about himself. I've just given you three instances in John's Gospel where Jesus claims to be God and says he is the only way to God. Now, this is not a popular teaching, and you are not going to be popular at the office if you hold to this. We live in a world today that tells you that any spirituality is valid, that they're all the same, that they're all equal. We're all just on different paths going up the same mountain. And doesn't that sound so sweet? And you'll get along with people if you'll go along with that. If you say, yeah, you're right. Buddha's just like Jesus, and Muhammad's just as equal. And you'll get along with people if you say that. But here's the thing, Buddha, Muhammad, uh, uh, what's his name, the, the Scientology guy, Hubbard and, and others, uh, none of them were the divine sons of the eternal one. None of them were God. None of them took upon themselves the weight of man's sin. We must believe that this truth matters for distinctiveness, for clarity, for the exclusivity of Jesus Christ. Not only must this doctrine be understood and defended, it must be believed in order to be saved. That's right. We must believe that the divinity of Jesus matters for eternal life. You say, wait a minute, I like the Sunday school Jesus, Pastor. I like the Jesus that holds my hand and tells me to love others. But I'm not so sure about this. You're, you're saying he's eternal and he's equal with God. And, and yes, this truth is divisive and controversial. But it is essential to understand that for Jesus to be the mediator between God and man, he had to be God and man. God, who is offended at our sin, who is the only perfectly righteous and holy one, who is offended by our sin, God alone can remove that debt. It is God alone that can remove the debt of sin that you have incurred by choice and by nature. God's holiness will not allow him to simply overlook your sin. To just pass by it. We have a holy God who because he is just and because he is holy and because he is sovereign, he must address sin. But the same holiness that separates him from us makes it possible for him to bear the burden and to deal with the consequence himself. The same thing that makes it impossible for you to deal with your own sin. You're a sinner. You have sin against you. It's in your nature and you choose it. You are guilty. You cannot reconcile yourself to God. It took a spotless lamb. It took the spotless lamb of God Jesus Christ. Only does the atonement make sense if Jesus Christ is the sinless Lamb of God, the Messiah, the Son of God, who took upon himself the debt of our sins. And this is why the Apostle Paul will say in Romans chapter 3 that God is able to be both just and the justifier of the one who has faith in in Jesus, in order to show his righteousness at the present time, God, that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus, sent his son as the propitiation for our sins by his blood. I ask you in closing this morning, is this the Jesus that you have believed on? Is this the Christ that you follow? See, believing in Jesus as John presents him in these two verses will change the way you look at your Christian life. 
It'll change the way you worship. You're worshiping the holy God of eternity. Jesus is not just your bro. He's not just the big guy upstairs. He's not just your buddy. This is the second person of the eternal triune God that you worship. That's who you're called to follow and be conformed to the image of in discipleship. It changes the way you live. Is this the Jesus Christ that you know and have followed? I know these things are hard. And like those disciples in John chapter 6 who turn away, many will walk away today saying, I'm not so sure I can accept that. But I'm asking you this morning to consider what the scriptures say. Is this the Jesus you've believed on? The Son of God, God himself, wrapped in flesh, dying for our sins. Have you trusted in him for eternal life? And are you following him with the fullness of of your being this morning. If you are not, then today would be the day for you to say, I need Christ. I need the Word made flesh who died for my sins. I need Him as my Savior. I want to follow Him. If you're following anything else, turn from it this morning and embrace Christ. As we pray together and prepare for our invitation, Father, Speak to us concerning these truths from your word. As I told the church, I knew these would be hard and difficult truths. We're talking about time and eternity. We're talking about fully God and fully man. We're talking about difficult things that challenge our reason. But Father, if there's anything that should overcome a challenge to our reason. It should be the certainty of your word. And so may we this morning yield our reason to the full revelation of your word concerning Jesus. May we yield our lives to him as Lord and as Savior. May we commit ourselves to knowing him and making him known. Father, change us, transform us for the glory of your Son. And should there be any here today, Father, who have heard this message, who know in their hearts right now that they're not following Christ, they may have gotten baptized or prayed a prayer some time ago, or maybe they never have, but they've not committed themselves fully to the eternal Son who wrapped himself in flesh, died for our sins, and calls us to repent and follow him. Lord, if they're here this morning and they're hearing my voice, draw them now by your spirit and we will rejoice. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Stand together, church, as we sing. One more verse. If the Spirit of God is moving, you come.